If someone came up to me and asked me, what is the greatest movie sequel of all time? I'd probably actually say Toy Story 2, which isn't a movie I would have thought I would have said a while ago, but upon re-watching the movie recently, I've realized not only just how good this movie is, and I always thought it was good, but that it genuinely is one of the greatest sequels ever made, if not the greatest sequel ever made. You see, there is a distinct difference between a great sequel and a great movie, and of course, it is possible to be both at the same time, but there are different aspects to a great sequel than there is to what makes a great great movie. You could be a great movie, but a terrible sequel. Or you could be a great sequel, but a terrible movie. Or you could be the best of both worlds, like Toy Story 2. Just about every scene in this movie is simply iconic. And it's hard to define what exactly makes a scene iconic. The visuals, the music, the writing, maybe a mix of all three. But I know one thing for certain, the many scenes of Toy Story 2 are very iconic. But what exactly is it about this movie that makes it such a great movie and such a great sequel? Well, don't worry, you'll definitely understand by the time I'm done explaining everything in this video. Oh, and also, you guys really liked my last Pixar analysis video, so here's to hoping this one reaches the same heights. What better place to start analyzing the movie than, of course, the beginning? This opening sequence of Buzz Lightyear on Zerg's planet is surprisingly not all that consequential to the plot, so in that sense, it's a bit of a strange way to open the movie. Although you could argue, you know, it's part of Rex's character development, which is kind of a strange subplot in this movie, and theoretically, you could remove all those scenes and the rest of the story would be pretty much the same. But then again, why would you ever want to do that? This opening is amazing! This is hands down one of the greatest film openings I have ever seen. Not just because it's super fun and action packed and filled with Star Wars references, but also because of how clever it is and surprisingly atmospheric. And also, I should mention that the Star Wars references aren't just a fun pop culture kind of thing, but they also tie into the first movie, with Buzz Lightyear's backstory in the first movie being a parody of Star Wars and all, which is just one of the small ways this movie perfectly follows up on the first movie. And of course, we get to see our first glimpse of Zerg in this scene, which is pretty cool actually, because Zerg was a character who was only mentioned in the first movie, and here we get to see him in the very opening shot of the second movie, something that probably most viewers were not expecting to see. Since Buzz Lightyear not being a space ranger and all, probably gave off the impression that Zerg wasn't really real and we'd probably never get to see him after all. But thankfully that wasn't the case because Zerg is pretty epic. I mean, it's almost an impossible task to say which Toy Story character has the best design, but Zerg is definitely a contender for that spot. But the greatest part of this opening is the twist at the end of it. The part where Buzz Lightyear is shot dead and incinerated by Zerg. I just love how much of this scene completely subverts our expectations in a good way. I know that word has come to mean bad things these days. And then of course it is revealed that all of this was actually just a video game, not real. And that the player, Rex, only lost because his arms were too short to press the buttons. <laughs> Which leads me to another topic this movie is very good at, and that, of course, is the comedy. This is still one of Pixar's funniest movies they've ever made. What's that? Jesse and Prospector are trapped in the old abandoned mine, and Prospector just lit a stick of dynamite thinking it was a candle, and now they're about to be blown to smithereens? <laughs> Ride like the wind, Bullseye! In a lot of ways, it's pretty close with the first movie in terms of his comedy. Even if the highest funny points of the first movie are probably still a bit funnier, this movie is also very consistent throughout. Even jokes that shouldn't work, like the one with this Butte sticker on Buzz Lightyear at the end. Like, that shouldn't be funny, you know? <laughs> Butte, get it? Like, butt? But for some reason, it is. Well, actually, I'm not just gonna leave you at that. I can explain why this joke is still funny. It's because the movie doesn't put any emphasis on it. The joke wouldn't be funny, for example, if the movie had zoomed in on his rear and slowly zoomed out. That would be putting too much emphasis on the joke and it would just come off as a bit cringy. But because it's just a simple shot of Buzz Lightyear running forward and they leave it up to the audience to notice the detail of the sticker. It's funny because we noticed something that the movie didn't put any emphasis on. Okay, I'm done explaining why the Butte sticker thing is funny now. I'm back to where we were. Before we get into all the deep emotional story stuff, let's just keep the Buzz Lightyear ball rolling and talk about all the rest of his scenes first. So plot plot yada yada, Woody is captured. But when Woody is being captured, Buzz Lightyear does not just stand there. He immediately jumps out the window to go and rescue Woody because they're 
friendship really means something to him now, perfectly following up from the first movie, where of course they had a very rocky relationship until the end. I always hate it when movies regress characters back to how they were, cause, oh, that's how it was in the first one, so we gotta do it again, or the audience might not like it as much, or some such nonsense, you know. I just make Buzz and Woody have a rocky relationship for the whole movie again. That'd be pretty lame. I mean, of course, there is some, you know, disagreements later on, but they don't last very long because the characters have come to understand each other by this point. And I like how this movie shows just how clever Buzz Lightyear actually is. He's able to put together several subtle hints as to who captured Woody. With just a feather and a license plate, he's able to put two and two together and figure out that it was Al from Al's toy barn who actually captured Woody. This is of course important because some people seem to misunderstand Buzz Lightyear. They think because he thought that he was a space ranger and not a toy, that he is somehow stupid. But you see, Buzz Lightyear was never stupid. Buzz Lightyear was able to do several things in the first movie that no idiot would be able to do. He clearly knew to put a seatbelt on when he was inside the car. He came up with the plan to infiltrate Pizza Planet by using the trash. And he is very good at organizing all the toys in Andy's room to make them work on a very efficient schedule to repair his ship, and many other things as well. And if you don't see the point of what I'm saying right now, uh, that's because this is a dig at Toy Story 4 for completely ruining Buzz Lightyear's character and turning him into an idiot. But anyways, Buzz Lightyear puts together a team to go save Woody. And pretty much all the scenes featuring Buzz Lightyear and the gang are amongst the most iconic in this movie. The crossing the road scene is literally so iconic that it is on the cover of the Blu-ray copy that I own. And not to mention this crossing the road scene is a perfect example of show don't tell comedy done right. The only thing anyone ever says in this scene is stop and go. And what makes it so funny is just how much chaos the toys end up unfolding just by crossing the road. Oh, and of course the part where Mr. Potato Head almost gets squished without even realizing it because of the poor vision of the cone, and then topped off with that extra cherry of. Ah, oh, that went well. Pure perfection. But is it as much perfection as the next part? The Owl's Toy Barn section of the movie is the absolute stuff of a legend. The best legends, of course. What I love most about the Owl's Toy Barn segment is how perfectly it expands upon the idea of toys coming to life. Like I said, perfectly following up on the first movie. One of the things a great sequel should always do, to find the perfect balance of something new, but still within the realm of what the first movie was about. And this toy store is perfect. Of course, the best part of the Owl's Toy Barn section is when Buzz meets Buzz, and Buzz, and Buzz, and Buzz, and Buzz, and like 5,000 Buzz Lightyears. Of course, he only interacts with one of them because, I mean, we can't have 5,000 Buzz Lightyears talking about at the same time. That that wouldn't really work, would it? And of course, this scene is a meme legend at this point. But memes alone do not make a great scene. But what does make this scene so great is when Buzz Lightyear does interact with that other Buzz Lightyear, which is yet another example of perfectly building off the first movie. In the behind the scenes making of for this movie, the director talks about how the funniest part of Buzz Lightyear in the first movie was that he didn't realize he was a toy and thought he was an actual space ranger, and he realized that Buzz Lightyear might not be as funny in this movie if they didn't have those parts. But they can't just reverse his character development, that'd be stupid, right? So then they had the big brain, genius idea of having two Buzz Lightyears, one who knows what a toy is and one who doesn't, and he's at war against himself to convince himself that he's a toy. And even though they're similar, their world experiences shape them into different people. As we see, the second Buzz Lightyear change throughout this movie to become a different person than the Buzz Lightyear that we know, even though they're technically the same toy. A subtle bit of nature versus nurture messaging there. And of course I can't not mention just how hilarious it is to see Buzz Lightyear in Woody's position from the first movie, yet again showing us just how much he's grown from the first movie. Also, the idea of multiple toys of the same character existing is also just genius. In the first movie, we never saw two of the same toy. Every character was essentially distinct from each other. But here, of course, we know the truth, which is that no toy is completely unique. There's gonna be thousands and thousands of copies. Of course, while all this is happening, Rex has managed to find himself a player's guide to the Buzz Lightyear video game he failed at at first, which not only helps him to discover the secret to defeating Zerg, but also serves as an explanation for what would otherwise be a minor plot problem. That being, why does 
does this Buzz Lightyear join up with the other toys? Ah, uh, of course. Buzz Lightyear thinks the other toys are setting out to destroy Zerg because that's what Rex wants to do in the video game. But this Buzz doesn't realize he's talking about a video game. He thinks Zerg is real. So of course he interprets it as we must defeat Zerg, you have the key. The writers of this movie thought through everything. And speaking of Zerg, the real Buzz Lightyear attempting to escape from the copy and paste aisle ends up accidentally unleashing Zerg. A toy, of course, not the real Zerg. And I absolutely love this detail on Zerg. Of all those toys where you could look through something and it would alter your vision. Which actually leads me into another point of why this movie is so good. It's because even though the first movie did a pretty good job of showing us a world of toys and how their lives are different from ours, I feel like this movie plays into the idea of these being toys even more than the first movie does. There are just so many clever ideas in this movie relating to toys and what happens to them, where they come from, how they feel about everything. This movie genuinely makes you rethink the existence of your very own toys even though you know they're not real. So of course Zerg follows the other toys as they head out to the true location of Woody inside Al's apartment. And I think this whole apartment is a really great example of just how much the scale of this movie is increased from the first movie. In the first movie, it was basically just Andy's house, Sid's house, and a quick trip to Pizza Planet and back. And that was about it. Not too many locations or anything crazy, but in this movie we've already talked about crossing the street, going to a toy store, a 23 floor apartment building, an air Port where we get to see inside the baggage section. Sometimes I wonder, the scale of this movie is so grand that even Toy Story 3 almost feels less grand despite it being the climax and still a fairly epic movie. So anyways, the rescue mission gets a bit complicated and Zerg comes in when the toys are trying to make their way out of the building now. And I love how the battle between Buzz and Zerg here perfectly replicates their fight at the beginning of the movie, but it doesn't go completely awry like how it did with the game in the beginning since Buzz Lightyear himself is more skilled than Rex trying to play Buzz Lightyear. And then of course there's the legendary I am your father spoof scene. No Buzz, I am your father. No! Which for some reason they decided to completely throw out the window when they were making Lightyear. And yes, I know it was a spoof, but still, I mean, as far as we know, in universe it's canon. Like, why would they put that in the toy if it didn't happen in the movie? Which the Lightyear movie is supposed to be the movie that Andy saw, which therefore these are the toys based on that movie. Why would he say he's his father if he isn't? Eh, that's enough of Lightyear ranting, back to the good movie. The best part of the whole fight, of course, is when Rex finally achieves greatness and defeats Zerg. And I love how he's so satisfied with defeating Zerg here that he doesn't even care about finishing the game. Well, I suppose that wraps up all the stuff with Buzz Lightyear and the toys. But of course, as great as all those scenes are, the real meat of the movie is all the stuff involving Woody. In the first movie, Buzz Lightyear is the one who's forced to make the really hard decision where Woody knows the truth and he has to learn to accept that he won't always be the favorite toy, and that his jealousy is turning him into a villain. But Buzz Lightyear is forced to completely rethink his entire existence, which nearly drives him to depression. But once they overcome that, they become the best of friends, realizing what really matters. However, in this movie, they've essentially swapped the roles of the main character. Although, Buzz Lightyear never almost becomes a villain like Woody did in the first movie. In this movie, it's Buzz Lightyear who's firmly in his stance on everything, and Woody who's forced to question everything and make the hard choices. At the beginning of the movie, Woody's afraid that Andy might not like him as much if he's missing his hat, and therefore he's not perfect, he's not complete, he's not good enough. Bo Peep tries to talk some sense into him, saying that his hat isn't what makes him Woody, and that if Andy truly loves him, he'll still play with him even if he doesn't have his hat. Woody is slightly skeptical, but he accepts Bo Peep's advice, and thankfully does find his hat. But not too long after, something much worse happens when his arm is ripped, and consequently, Andy chooses not to play with him or bring him on his trip, seemingly confirming his worst fears were actually right. It's such a heartbreaking scene when Andy puts Woody on the shelf and everyone asks if he's alright, and he just pulls himself back onto the shelf, not saying anything. The whole idea of a toy breaking is another really clever idea that perfectly follows up on the first movie. While toys did break in the first movie, the idea was more so that breaking a toy is wrong, like with how Sid Frankenstein a bunch of toys into weird amalgamations that aren't their true selves. Or it's played more for laughs like with Buzz's arm. But here, they really make you think about what does happen to these toys when they eventually break and wear down. As Andy's mom says, I'm sorry, 
honey, but you know, toys don't last forever. And of course, everyone in real life knows this, but most people probably wouldn't have thought how that would affect the actual characters in-universe. Until now, of course. Then of course we have the fantastically terrifying nightmare sequence of Woody, which really puts into perspective just how these toys feel about the idea that they won't last forever. If you really think about it, so long as a toy doesn't break or wear out, they're essentially immortal. However, if they break, they die, they're gone forever. In a world where you could live forever unless you break, breaking is the very worst thing that could happen to you. But just because he's broken, Woody's not just going to sit there when Wheezy, another broken toy, almost gets sent into a yard sale. But of course, uh, things don't exactly go too well, and Woody ends up being spotted by uh, Mr. Al over here. And one thing I really like about this scene is how Woody thinks he's worthless because his arm is broken, but the second that Al sees him, he sees him as the most valuable thing he's ever spotted in his entire life, despite the fact that his arm is broken. He basically just brushes off the arm being ripped as some minor inconvenience. This is actually a really clever scene that ties into Woody's choices later on in the movie, and I'm surprised I've never heard anyone else ever mention how clever this is. And of course, these big choices I've been referring to so far come as soon as Woody arrives at Al's apartment, and he discovers that there's so much more to him than he thought. The whole idea of Woody actually being this really big star from long ago is such a genius concept for a sequel, since in the first movie, the idea was that Buzz Lightyear thought he was bigger than he really was. But in this movie, Woody, who thought he was just any other toy, actually turns out to be really big and important. One of the big parts of the collection, of course, being the old TV show which Woody used to be a part of, called Woody is Roundup. And I love the detail that the show is so old that it's made with puppets in black and white, but alas, the show did not last forever. It got cancelled when people started to become more interested in sci-fi than old westerns. The climax of the show didn't even get made, leaving it unfinished. But because the show got cancelled, and production on all the toys and everything stopped, is of course the very reason why he's such a collectible toy now. And can I just say, I also love just how genius the idea of a collector's toy being part of the plot of this movie is. Since the first movie only really explored the idea of toys being played with by children, this movie dives into the idea that there are also adults who value toys just as much, but for very different reasons. Just yet another way this movie geniusly expands upon the ideas of the first. And of course, I have to mention the other three characters who relate to Woody, those of course being Jesse, Stinky Pete, and Bullseye, all of which are such great additions to the Toy Story universe that it's almost hard to imagine what it was like before they existed. While Bullseye is a fun addition, he has nothing on the other two characters, as the dynamic between Woody, Jesse, and Stinky Pete is really what makes this movie such a masterpiece. Each of these three characters present a unique perspective, having been shaped by their vastly different pasts and experiences, all brought together for one ultimate purpose, to be sent to a toy museum to forever be put on display. Woody, of course, doesn't want to go to the museum. He wants to go back to Andy's house because he believes that a toy being played with by a child is the very purpose of a toy and what they should strive for in life, to make a child happy. Stinky Pete wants to go to the museum because he believes that being in a collection is more valuable than being played with by a child, and Jessie wants to go to the museum for much more complicated reasons, but mainly because she doesn't see the value in being played with by a child anymore. So essentially it's two versus one, and the thing I most like about this decision that Woody is forced to make is that neither option is inherently bad. Both sides give good reasons for why being played with a child is a good thing and going to the museum is a good thing, but there's also downsides to both as well. Of course, Woody points out that the downside of going to the museum is that you'll never be played with by a child or loved by anyone ever again. You'll just be watched from behind glass for the rest of your life. Just a cool thing to look at. Sure, you're valued, but it's never anything personal. There is no relationship with an object behind a glass and a child looking at it from beyond, or more likely adult, since you know it's a museum. But then of course there's the counter argument against Woody, which is that being played with by a child won't last forever. Eventually, children grow up and they don't want to play with toys anymore. Of what value are you then? And of course, Jessie knows all this very personally. When Woody tries to argue with her that being played with by a child is the best choice and what he has to do, Jessie finally reveals why she She's so adamantly against the idea, in what is quite possibly the world's hardest try not to cry challenge. Until up anyways.
Also, Charles Muntz is one of the best Pixar villains, guys. I just hadn't seen up in a while and forgot about him. So you can stop posting comments about him on my Hopper video now. Anyways, where was I again? Oh yes, the try not to cry challenge. This scene is, in my opinion, quite possibly not just the greatest scene in this movie, but the greatest scene in Pixar history. And it's not just because it's sad, but because of how much depth and meaning there is behind it. Jessie used to be just like Woody. When her owner was younger, she used to play with her all the time and loved her like no one else. But those days could could not last forever. Eventually, Emily would grow up and change. No longer did she care about cowgirls or dolls or silly things like that. She wanted to be a real woman with makeup and cool friends and cars. But you see, Jessie couldn't understand that. All she knew was that being loved by a child was her purpose in life. So when Emily forgot about her, all those years of waiting, she held out hope that it was just a mistake. Emily still really does love her. But when Emily finally did find her, she didn't still love her. Her only thought was that it was pointless to keep her and it would be better to donate her off to someone else who could love her instead. What makes this so crushing for Jessie though, is that she waited all those years in vain hope, only to have all her hopes and dreams crushed in an instant. She wanted so badly for something to be true, only to realize in the end that it wasn't. It made her completely rethink her entire existence. All that time she thought Emily loved her, when for a good portion of that time, she didn't. But at the same time, it's hard to hate Emily's decision too. She'd changed over time and become a different person. And sometimes when people change, they are no longer compatible with each other. And the sad truth is that not all friendships last forever. And often when friendships break apart, it hurts one person much more than the other. All these factors have led Jesse to believe that being played with by a child is pointless because it'll just end one day and you'll be heartbroken. All this time, Woody thought that Jesse just had something against him and Andy, but in reality, Jesse was just trying to save him from having to face the same loss and heartbreak that she went through. And upon hearing this, Woody starts to reconsider his choice, as Woody also knows that what Jesse is saying is true. He's already been hurt by Andy choosing not to bring him to cowboy camp, and so far it seems like Al treats him with more respect. He even brought in Gary from the Gary's Game chess short, the most iconic and greatest Pixar short of all time, to fix his arm, in a scene that's just as iconic and great as the Gary's Game short. And of course, around now is when that scene I kind of skipped over earlier, where Buzz and the gang actually show up and find Woody takes place. And of course I skipped it because it relates more to Woody's story than their shenanigans. And this is another one of my favorite scenes in the movie as well. As Woody, who's now been convinced that going to the museum is the right choice, is forced to confront his new choice when Buzz shows up and Buzz reminds Woody of the very things he said to him in the first movie. And Buzz giving Woody the you are a toy is just perfection. Perfectly showcasing how both characters have changed over time. At this point, Buzz feels closer to Woody's ideals in the first movie than Woody does at this point. And it takes Woody turning down Buzz for him to finally realize that he's wrong. Going to the museum is not the right choice. As sometimes it takes us feeling the consequences of making the wrong choice for us to realize that it was the wrong choice. Woody now realizes that going to the museum isn't the best option. It's the selfish choice the choice that only benefits him. But being a toy is about more than just being loved by a child. It's about being there for them when they need you. And Woody at last realizes that the best option is to go back to Andy's house, but to also bring Jessie with him. That way she won't have to be sent back into storage. Jessie is uncertain, but seeing the power of Woody's convictions has managed to break a small hole in her hardened heart. But, uh-oh, looks like Stinky Pete isn't as honest as he seemed. And can we just talk about how great of a villain Stinky Pete actually is. I briefly mentioned in my Hopper video that he's one of my favorite Pixar villains, and there's definitely a lot of reasons why. First of all, his concept is pure genius. The idea of a toy who didn't sell well, and is essentially trapped inside his box because no one ever opened him to ever play with him, and thus causes him to become jealous of all the other toys who got played with, is simply perfect. And I love how Stinky Pete's jealousy kept festering in him until eventually it caused him to snap. And when he snapped, he suddenly thought, what if I'm better than all those toys who got played with? I'm superior to them. I'm perfect. They get played with and discarded, but I'll be in pristine condition forever. Stinky Pete tried to play the nice guy and powder Woody up as the greatest ever. That way he'd surely be convinced to go. But he overestimated Woody's ego, and now his act is over. And his motivation for going to the museum is really that he wants validation. He wants people to love and adore him 
because he never got any love in his life before. And he doesn't care whose lives he has to ruin in order to get what he wants. And another little detail adding to Stinky Pete's jealousy is when he gets upset that the Woody's Roundup show was cancelled because of a bunch of sci-fi space related stuff instead. And his complaint ties into his idea that things don't last forever, that eventually you'll be seen as worthless and thrown away. But thankfully, despite Stinky Pete sabotaging Woody's escape, he was able to shout out to Buzz at the last second to warn him. And here we have one of the greatest film climaxes of all time. And I really do mean that. I mean, first of all, we have the epic elevator scene with Zerg that I already talked about, followed by another equally as epic car chase scene, where the toys managed to drive a full-sized Pizza Planet truck and catch up with Al on his way to the airport. But even more than that, the actual airport scenes themselves. The baggage section scenes of this movie are quite possibly the most iconic thing to come from this movie. The amount of creativity going into this movie is absolutely mind-blowing. You wonder how did they come up with this idea that the climax of the movie would be set in the baggage section of an airport. Stinky Pete tries one last time to prove to Woody that his stance is right and Woody's is wrong, but instead Woody proves to him just how strong the power of love really is. If he is right and Andy truly does still want him, then he'll love him despite his flaws. But Stinky Pete could never understand the true power of the connection between a child and a toy. He has neither loved anyone or been loved by anyone in his entire life, and he'd rather love himself more than anyone else. And I absolutely love the way that Stinky Pete is defeated. He'd come to think that he was so far above all the other toys, that playtime was meaningless at this point to him, that now the very thing that he wanted all those years ago to be played with by a child is his worst nightmare, and so Woody gives him exactly what he wanted all those years ago. And unlucky for him, he ends up with uh, quite possibly the worst owner he could have wanted. Pure satisfaction. Unfortunately, they were dilly-dallying a little bit too much, and Jesse's box gets sent all the way to the actual airplane. But of course, Woody cannot let that happen. And when he rides off to save her, Randy Newman cleverly replays the song from Woody's Roundup when Woody was rushing off to save Jesse in the show. The movie respects your intelligence enough to connect the two dots before the actual characters do. And it's just crazy to me how all these Toy Story movies, except for, have such epic climaxes when they're about toys. <laughs> but I'm not complaining or anything because they're amazing. And of course, Woody does save Jessie from a terrible fate of being trapped alone forever for the rest of her life. And in the process, symbolically finishes the climax of Woody's roundup. And that of course brings us to the final scenes where we get a heartwarming close to Jessie's storyline as she finally gets another owner to love her like Emily once did. But most importantly, I like the final shot of Woody and Buzz where Woody explains that even if the good days don't last forever, he'd rather live them to their fullest than not have lived them at all. A beautiful final scene to close out the story. Everything about this movie just works so perfectly. Basic elements like the comedy and music are on point. The animation still holds up surprisingly well for a 1999 movie anyways. The characters and story are so perfectly written. Following up the ideas and premises introduced in the first movie in all the most genius and interesting ways, the arcs put our characters through tougher struggles than they faced in the first movie. Well, except maybe Buzz, who, you know, was forced to question his entire existence in the first movie. And they make us rethink the very way we see our own toys in real life. Now that's some mind-blowing stuff right there. And I absolutely love how the themes of this movie come back in Toy Story 3, when the ideas of toys just being trash that'll be thrown away one day is essentially the motivation for for Lotso's character arc, and the consequences of choosing to go back to Andy and live out the rest of his days being a toy loved by a child are fully explored. So in retrospect, Toy Story 3 makes Toy Story 2 an even better movie than it already was. And the craziest thing about Toy Story 2 is that the creators made the movie in nine months. True story. And all that combined is why I believe that Toy Story 2 might just be the greatest sequel ever made, and is surely one of the greatest movies ever made. If you enjoyed this video, why don't you check out my previous Pixar analysis of Hopper from A Bug's Life, or you could check out whatever random video YouTube has decided to recommend over here, but most importantly of all, stay iconic.